Hello! I am here today, gentle reader, to do my first wrap-up. It is almost the middle of June, but I don't want to call this my mid-month wrap-up, as I don't want to structure my wrap-ups this way. A, because I'd like to talk about only a few books at a time, and B, because I'd like to do themed wrap-ups, which of course requires themed reading. So what I'm going to do is, whenever I have read two, three, four books which share a common theme, I'm going to wrap them up here. When I started this channel at the beginning of the month, I was already reading a book, The Murder at the Vicarage, and I let that set the tone for these first two weeks. The books I have read have all been very cozy reads and also very British in one way or another. Except for one, which I just had to squeeze in there, and that is A Taste of Honey, the second to a novella by Kaya Shanti Wilson. I knew going into it that it wouldn't be another source of the wild leaps, so I was able to appreciate it for what it is. And it is a touching story about life at the end of the day, and I think anybody would be able to identify with it to a certain degree. It is set in the same Africanesque setting as the previous novella, and it is on its face a love story. Akib and Lucrio are lovers of the star-crossed kind, as in they are from different countries that are separated by the sea, and they meet in an extremely homophobic environment kind of star-crossed. Akib is from a family of courtiers in the great city of Alorum. He is the son and the assistant of the head of the royal menagerie. One night, when he is in the streets walking the cheetah, as you do, he is chatted up by a member of the imperial embassy from Dalus across the sea. You might also call it Rome. The embassy have been there on a long mission in order to negotiate trade agreements, but they are bound to leave in 10 days, so Akib and Lucrio embark on a somewhat desperate, passionate affair, and it is also a forbidden affair, as in Akib might end up being sentenced to death by public impalement for it, for sleeping with another man. Of course, he has the option to leave with Lucrio when the embassy sails. In fact, it would be pretty easy, because the embassy have actually made it a prerequisite of their coming at all that they would be allowed to take home with them any person that they have entered in a relationship with, and who is consenting. But it's not that easy for Aki. He is very conscious of what he thinks are his duties to the bunch of bullies that he calls his family, and his family have put all their hopes in him, because he happens to be the only one who can get them to rise through the ranks at court. And it's not an idle hope either, because Akib is actually very popular with the ladies at court. And then there are his responsibilities to the royal menagerie and propriety, and is eloping even a thing that one can seriously consider doing? I mean, is, is that really something one could do? I mean, it's just not that easy, is it? So the great big question is, what is Akib going to choose? And when he does choose, will it be the right choice? If he chooses one way, who knows what might happen and how his life would have looked differently had he chosen otherwise. If he stays, he loses what might be his one shot at happiness. But if he leaves, will he not forever wonder what he might have accomplished had he stayed at home at the royal court? A Taste of Honey is a quiet and an extremely melancholy story, but it is also quite the page-turner because of frequent time jumps. It has a beautiful setting and it's a lovely experience imagining yourself in the streets and gardens of a law room under a starry summer sky and with the noises of the night animals in the royal menagerie in the background. The language, while not as wildly experimental as in The Sorcerer of the Wild Deeps, is still half the magic of the story, and the world-building relies heavily on the imaginative and idiosyncratic writing style. This was a lovely short read, but it can also cause you quite a lot of anguish, on behalf of the characters, but also on behalf of yourself, so be warned. Unto the cozy British reads. Ring of Bright Water by Gavin Maxwell. These are Maxwell's memoirs of his life on a remote estate in the Scottish Highlands, on the coast opposite the Isle of Skye. Maxwell was from the Lowlands originally, but he settled there for a time in early middle age, in a house that he called Camus Firna. There he adopts an otter, and then another, and this is the moving and unforgettable story of his life with them, and the shenanigans that they got up to, and of his love for them. This is a dearly beloved classic of British nature writing, and like most classics, it is ripe with problems. But I dare say that this one is a bit more ripe than most others. Now, 
I was prepared for a spiritualistic babble, lots of anthropomorphizing and tried and cheesy remarks about men in nature and nature in general, like look how the seasons are always changing and oh look how wide and green the ocean is. And all that I got in spade, in the most pretentious of purple proses imaginable, which clearly served first and foremost the purpose of showing off the author's formal education. What I was not prepared for was the gross insensitivity and the delusional self-aggrandization of our esteemed author. Now, Maxwell was a bloke from the south of Scotland. He's Oxford educated, he's the grandson of the Duke of Northumberland or some such, in any case wealthy and landed, who basically goes on a nature retreat and thinks himself very special indeed for it. And he proceeds to teach you all about Scottish wildlife and a bit of the social history of the Highlands, which in fact he is not that knowledgeable about. After 80 pages of this nature drivel we get to the main topic at last. When his dog Johnny dies, lucky him, Maxwell is on the lookout for another pet and he somehow sets his heart on adopting an otter. Now, I was expecting to see Scottish sea otters here, but no, nothing as plebeian as that for our author. He somehow sets his heart on buying and trafficking an Iranian otter, of all things. Apparently that wasn't illegal at the time, but it should still be looked upon as somewhat less than romantic by a modern reader. I mean, extracting an animal from its natural habitat, uh, keeping it in a London studio flat for a month, and also introducing a, f a specimen of a foreign species into your home environment, I mean, and the way he goes about it. The first baby otter that he buys in the Middle East dies in his care within hours. And the replacement, poor Mishbil, is put in an airtight box and stowed away with the luggage during the return journey, which of course takes longer than expected and poor Mishbil is running out of oxygen. I'll read you the passage when he declares his luggage in London. Then the customs officer turned to the last item on my list, one live otter. He pondered this in silence for perhaps a minute. Then, you have with you a live otter. I said that I very much doubted whether it was still alive, but that it had been when at Paris. I mean, like it's the airport's fault. And then the joyous reunion. I prized open the lid of the box and Mishbil clambered out into my arms to greet me with a frenzy of affection that I felt I had hardly merited. No! Whatever makes you say so? So, this is not exactly the heartwarming story of a boy who finds solace in nature with the animals. This is the blown-up romanticization of the selfish whims of a self-enamored brat. I don't recommend this, <laughs> in case you were wondering. Okay, <laughs> on to the next cozy read. Thomas the Rhymer by Alan Kushner. This is the retelling of the legend of the Scottish poet of the same name, Thomas the Rhymer, who was a historical figure in the 13th century, but almost everything else that we hear about him is made up. According to legend, he was a golden-tongued minstrel who was whisked away into Fairyland by the Queen of Fairyland and made to stay there for seven years and on his release back to the mortal world, the Fairy Queen puts an enchantment on him so that he can from then on only speak the truth. As in, he cannot lie and as in, he speaks truth, as in, he is a prophet. This of course causes all kinds of anguish and all kinds of awkward situations. The book begins a few months before Thomas is claimed by the Fairy Queen. It is told in four parts, each with its own narrator. And the first part is narrated by an old farmer, Gavin, who holds Thomas for a week when he falls ill on the road and needs a roof over his head. Then, after a season of wandering from court to court and being a minstrel, Thomas comes back to stay with the farmer and his wife for a few more months. As they later learn, he is hiding from a lord who wants the skin for seducing his fiancée. Because being a minstrel, Thomas is quite the charmer. And when he stays with Gavin, he stays in character and, and strikes up a romance with Gavin's young neighbor, Elspeth. He is not exactly deeply in love with the girl, though. And when the fairy queen shows up in the field one fine mid-morning and asks him to sleep with her, he doesn't ask any questions. 
that means that he has entered into a contract with a fairy queen and has to let her take him with her to fairyland for seven years. This part is narrated by Thomas himself. The third and fourth parts are from an outside perspective again, from the farmer's wife Meg and from the love interest Elspeth. I am afraid that this is all quite tedious. <laughs> now, I loved Swords Point by Alan Kushner, and to a large extent because of the writing style and the incredible melancholy atmosphere that Alan Kushner was able to evoke with that writing style, and I expected something similar here. And it does have a certain dreamlike quality to it. But the language is also extremely quaint and not in an obviously self-ironic way, but rather I think it's supposed to emulate what we think of as early modern fairyland speak. But most of all, there doesn't seem to be any point to this retelling. Not only do we know the outcome from the start, but Kushner doesn't do anything new with the topic. She just retells it, as in tells it again. But it is just too simple a tale for that. Thomas is being a minstrel and then he goes off to fairyland and does what one does in fairyland and then he comes back and resumes being a mortal minstrel, only now a grumpy one. The longest part of the book is the part that takes place in fairyland, 120 pages, almost half the book. And the problem is there are no stakes there. Thomas has no agenda there, he has no task or higher purpose, he has nothing to do besides being there and doing what one does in fairyland, singing, harping, feasting, hunting and pleasing the fairy queen sexually. I was bored out of my mind five pages into this part and I skim read the rest of it. Unfortunately that made me lose interest and I ended up skim reading the third and fourth parts as well, but no harm done there because nothing much happens in those parts either. Thomas comes back from fairyland and is in a melancholy mood for 80 pages and he speaks a prophecy or two and that's basically it. Oh, don't get me wrong, I do enjoy books that aren't massively plot driven but there has to be some point to what is being told or something new and interesting being done. But this is just a bloated fairyland fan fiction told in an embarrassingly baroque style. To be fair, this is an older book, but still, I, I felt myself thinking that I might as well have read the original ballad, as at least this one would have been really old and of literary and historical interest. Yeah, so <laughs> that was a letdown as well. On to a more positive ending to this video, the one that you know has been coming, The Murder at the Vicarage by Agatha Christie. I left this until the very end because I'd like to talk about a spoilery thing at the end after I wrap this video up. This is, of course, the first novel-length case of the famous Miss Marple and it takes place in her home village of St. Mary Mead. There, Colonel Prothero is found shot in the head in the vicar's study and it's anyone's guess who did it because the old bloke was universally loathed and every other inhabitant of the village has a motive. And the vicar was even overheard just the day before telling his dinner party that anybody who did the old bastard in would be doing the world a service. Old Miss Marple can think of no fewer than seven suspects and that isn't even counting the two persons who have already confessed to being the murderer. So this is the main introduction to the elderly spare time detective Miss Marple. But Miss Marple doesn't actually get that much screen time in the book, which surprised me. It is actually narrated by the vicar, which is a good choice because while Miss Marple makes everybody's private life her own business, it is the vicar that people seek out voluntarily and that they readily confide in. Still, the book hinges around Miss Marple as she is literally and topographically in the center of the action as she is always in her garden next to the vicarage and makes everybody feel compelled to talk to her. The, the book paints a picture of village life with its typical ensemble, with its gossip and its petty feuds and its exceedingly tame scandals. It is bitingly funny and merciless, but in an ultimately benevolent fashion. I haven't always been entertained by Agatha Christie's books in the past, but this one was a delight from the first page to the last. There was one thing, though, that made me a little uncomfortable. It contains the minor spoiler of the murderer's identity, so if you don't want to know who done it at this point, please tune out now. 
Thanks for watching and I'll see you very soon with the next video. Okay, is it safe to talk? So it is mentioned twice in the book that our murderer Lawrence Wedding is of Irish descent. This is a rather random fact and nothing is done with it. So I, I wondered why it is mentioned at all. Since it is mentioned twice, it seems to be deliberate. I can think of two alternatives. A. It is supposed to endear us to him, the Irish always being some sort of underdog, and it's supposed to discourage us from suspecting him. Or B, the more sinister alternative, it is supposed to be a hint, and at the end we are supposed to say, ah, the Irish one, of course, I should have guessed. Now, I don't know enough about Agatha Christie to know which one's the more likely alternative. Or, of course, there's a third one that I'm imagining things here. If you have to, some light to shed on this topic, I'd be very much interested to hear what you say. So, again, thank you for watching. Bye, gentle reader, and I'll see you very soon.